A casualty in the Battle of the Rig was Katara's necklace, a gift from her late mother, which was claimed by Zuko. This leads us into the two-part Winter Solstice story, where Zuko is now closing in on Aang, where much is revealed. Uh, not all of it pleasant. It starts off with the gang finding a forest devastated by the Fire Nation and a nearby village being attacked by a spirit monster. To stop it, Aang must enter the spirit world, as he is the bridge between worlds. While the classic elements of earth, air, fire, and water are well known, not many know there is usually a fifth. The Greeks called it ether, the Japanese void, but the idea essentially remains the same, that there is an intangible present as well, energy, spirit, what have you. The Avatar, master of all elements, must also have a connection with this. Eventually Aang winds up in the spirit world by accident, where a dragon takes him to a statue of Roku in the Firebender Temple, so that Aang learns he must come here on the solstice to commune with his former self, who will be his guide. For the moment, Aang must calm the monster spirit and succeeds, resulting in the ultimate sad panda, but ending the spirit's need for random vengeance. While this has gone on, Iroh was captured by the Earth Kingdom forces and Zuko forced to pursue and rescue him. While Aang's flying around on the spirit dragon, both at some point spot the dragon, hinting at the connection that they might have with it. Interestingly, Zuko has the chance to try to follow Aang and the abandon his uncle to do so, but his loyalty to his mentor is greater than his need to capture Aang, so he aids in the old man's escape. This is a subtle hint at the prince's backstory choosing loyalty to one of his men over the mission. The second part then deals with Aang's trip to the temple within the Fire Nation, which, for obvious reasons, is dangerous for all of them, as well as the pursuing Zuko, because he's banished, so he can't go back in there because banished means stay the hell out. But in the end, after our heroes have battled their way past the blockade, Zhao just lets Zuko pass. Iroh knows his real plan is to follow Zuko, so he leaves his ironclad behind to pursue Aang himself. Meanwhile at the temple, the fire sages meant to serve the Avatar reveal that they have turned against him, corrupted by the Fire Lord, a symbol of how he is having this effect upon his people, which succeeded only because of Aang's absence. Only one remains loyal to Aang, a symbol that while it may seem that they are this monolith of evil, the Fire Nation is as much a part of the world as any other and can be saved. Indeed, it is necessary to maintain the balance. And one of the most important um, elements about the Avatar is revealed, the hope that he offers. It was the absence of it that allowed the Fire Sages to be turned to the side of the Fire Lord, but it is the return of it that we repeatedly see, from Grand Grand back in the South Pole Village, and repeated again and again. Where Aang goes, hope is restored. There's a confrontation when Zuko and Zhao both arrive, but Aang is able to meet with Roku, who explains that this mess all started when a previous Fire Lord used the power of a passing comet to strengthen his armies, since a comet, being made of rocks, ice, and gases, naturally powers the one element that's not actually present. When it returns, the Fire Lord will be so powerful that Aang may not even be able to stop him. So he's got until the end of summer to learn all these abilities needed to be Avatar. No pressure. Roku's parting gift is to free everyone and destroy his temple, but sadly the loyal fire mage is captured by Zhao again, but at least there's hope now. But it does depend upon Aang mastering the remaining three elements, leading us into the water scroll. Katara offers to show Aang some of what she's figured out, but his easy mastery of her life's work makes her jealous and feeling inadequate, so when they find a waterbending scroll in the possession of some pirates, she steals it with disregard for the threat that she now brings upon all of them. But luckily it all works out. But it is another sign of the multidimensional nature of the characters. While Katara is usually guided by conscience, her obsession with waterbending again gets the better of her. Sokka, where do you think they got it? They stole it from a waterbender. It doesn't matter. You put all of our lives in danger just so you could learn some stupid fancy splashes. These are real waterbending forms. You know how crucial it is for Aang to learn waterbending. And again, she's willing to rationalize away things when it comes to her own concerns. A very human thing. It'll manifest in a similar way when we get to Earth. The next chapter demonstrates the effect the war is having on the world. In Jet, a teenager that Katara quickly admires and trusts more than her own brother, leads a group of guerrillas against the Fire Nation's occupying forces, but his obsession over his loss leads him to become an even greater threat to the Earth Kingdom than they are. In the following episode, The Great Divide, we discover refugees who join our heroes in a trek across a canyon so that they can rebuild. 
their civilization, not the canyon, obviously. Aang must step up as a leader to help them succeed despite their divisions. This brings us to one of the big episodes of Water, the Storm. General Iroh senses a storm coming and suggests a detour for safety, but it will allow the Avatar to get even further ahead of them, so Zuko refuses, uncaring about the safety of his crew. Finding the Avatar is far more important than any individual safety. He doesn't mean that. He's just all worked up. And when the storm starts to come, the lieutenant finally gives voice to their frustrations, and it nearly comes to blows before Iroh intercedes, and later fills the men in on Zuko's true story. Two years before, he had wanted to join in the war room, if only to learn, but it was on condition of silence. But upon hearing the general's plan to deliberately send loyal but inexperienced soldiers into a battle they could not win, purely to gain a tactical advantage, he spoke out against the plan. Because of this, he had to engage in a fire duel except it wasn't against the general, but his own father, the Fire Lord. When he tried to plead with his father, well, he got that nasty scar and banishment. The only chance he has to return and reclaim his honor is to find the Avatar, hence the significance of his line back in the second episode when he had Aang in his clutches about returning home. The line held far more meaning than it first seemed. It wasn't just a simple declaration of destination, but a sign that he had completed his exile and was going to return home with full honor. But the ironic thing about his connection with the Avatar, which brings so much hope wherever he goes, is that Aang brings hope to Zuko as well. And during the storm, when his crew is threatened, Zuko risks himself to save him, showing that Iroh was right. He didn't really mean what he was saying, because he still believes in the importance of his subordinates. Whether his mentor uncle or the lowliest sailor, they're more important than the mission. The storm also provides us some of Aang's backstory how he wound up in that iceberg, after he gets a dressing down by an old fisherman for being a hundred years late. It turns out that the monks of his temple, against the advice of Aang's favorite teacher, told Aang that he was the Avatar years before he should. They were afraid of the threat the Fire Nation posed and so rushed things. But another theme for the series is that shortcuts are not the way. You need to do things the proper way. Have patience. Like Zuko neglecting his basics in order to learn advanced firebending faster, wound up biting him in the ass later on. By revealing it before Aang was ready and putting all this pressure on him to save the world, they wound up driving him to fly off in despair, get caught in a storm, and only survive by entombing himself and Appa in the ice. Because they had moved before he was ready, the war that they had tried to avert came, annihilated the airbenders, and led to a hundred years of hopelessness and terror. And we see the frailty of Aang himself as he feels his world collapsing around him until he's driven to run away, the burden that it is to be the Avatar, tearing him between his instinctive desire to enjoy life and the enormity of the responsibility that's been placed on him. His rescue of Sokka and the old fisherman helps him see that regardless of what happened, he's here, now, and able to make a difference. The complex relationship between Aang and Zuko is central to the next chapter, The Blue Spirit. With Zhao promoted to Admiral, he has the authority to pull in the forces to finally capture Aang, with the plan to hold him captive for the rest of his life to stop his interference and not to allow him to reincarnate as a new avatar. But Zuko, in the guise of the Blue Spirit, breaks him out, if only so that later on he can capture him himself. This is followed by the Fortune Teller, which rekindles the Aang is infatuated with Katara thread that really hasn't been hinted at since The Boy in the Iceberg. This leads to Bato of the Water Tribe, where we finally meet one of the soldiers who left with Katara and Sokka's father, and we get more of an understanding of Sokka. Sokka's primary role has been the comic relief character, usually by being the target of misfortune, but despite that, his ingenuity has often managed to help the group succeed. But we see where Sokka's personality issues come from. He desperately wanted to join his father in the battle against the Fire Nation, but he still wasn't old enough, so his father told him to watch over the village. That's why he was willing to stand up to Zuko past the point of sanity, and so insisted upon prepping children to fight him, because it was what he was left behind to do. Bato was injured and forced to stay behind here while the rest of the warriors moved on, but he sees Sokka's need to be a warrior like his father, and it takes him on a rite of passage to steer a boat through hazardous waters. Interestingly, this act is exactly like the incident at the very beginning of the series when he was trying to navigate the ice flows that their boat was in that got smashed up and that was how they found Aang. Now he is capable of not just succeeding at that task but using his ingenuity to surpass all expectations. This is counterbalanced by Aang's selfishness. 
On hearing that there will be a messenger coming that would allow Sokka and Katara to reunite with their father, Aang's far more concerned with them leaving him, and he hides the message. Given the way that he's lost everyone, it's understandable how desperate he might be to hold on to the only friends he has left, so much so that he's willing to do something terrible to them to keep them. What he doesn't realize is that they realize that they're needed with him and are willing to wait until after they've helped Aang before reuniting with him. But from finding out the truth, they're so disgusted with his self-centeredness and deception that they depart. The only thing that could reunite them now is an evil scheme. But luckily, Zuko's around to provide one. He has sought out a master bounty hunter to track Aang down with her giant rat fox luxon beast thing. She's a lithe, whip-wielding, hard-drinking, tough young woman who could frankly only be hotter if... Oh, I'd love to help you out, but I'm a little short on money. Drinks on me! If she were voiced by Jennifer Hale. Marry me, June. She leads him to Aang in the end, and there's a fight where Appa actually gets to play a major role, and Aang's able to recover the necklace from Zuko before they escape, so our heroes are happy, and so is Iroh. Uncle, I didn't see you get hit with the tongue. 